to the electric fence. No. I think it was the moon. George thinks they were thirsty, but the I think moon. it was. Well, it's not such a bright night. I think they just got rested. Mm. They just went straight through the fence. Is it? Well, they through the fence. They just took most of it with it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I started winding it up, but then. I... Watch your hands. It's. Uh, yeah, but it's going to get tangled again. Got this mass of it. It's all going the these were all run-of-the-mill difficulties that John and his team had realistically predicted for themselves. But there remained one supreme test for men and animals before the drove could continue. In the old days, the drovers used to make their herds swim the treacherous ocean strip which separates Sky from the mainland. Kay was determined to try that too. Cattle do swim, but would these comparatively domesticated animals show much stomach for it. Would the drovers have the skill to get them across? Before risking his herd in the Atlantic Ocean, he decided to have a rehearsal in the freezing cold but comparatively quiet waters of a sea lock. You can lead a bullock to water, but you can't necessarily make him swim. At least, not in the direction you want him to go. With the help of some local fishermen, the drovers make quite a splash. In the end, the cattle decide that bracing as an October dip in a Scottish lock may be for humans, they prefer terra firma. I've seen bees swimming, certainly, but many a time, but I never, I've never had the trick at all. This is my first go. <laughs> what we haven't really got is we haven't got a good enough leader, have we? At the same time, the next day, the drovers try again. The theory is that in a smaller group of, say, half a dozen, the cattle will be less distracted and will swim across. That's the theory. In the event, it's the drovers who show more liking for cold water. One beast is eventually roped and towed across the lock without mishap. Despite the wet clothes and squelching boots, the drovers aren't disheartened. They have tried what many said couldn't be done, and they've nearly done it. Well, I think we've proved it's very, very difficult. I think we've wound the cattle, you could, but these are too tame. They're too docile and they're not sufficiently frightened. They won't just run into the water to get away from us. Um, and without um, <coughs> terrorising them in a way that we're not prepared to do, um, that, you know, that's, that's no good. Times change. The old drovers, with neither the cruelty man nor contemporary niceties to contend with, were not so caring. They thought nothing of lashing one beast's jaw to the tail of the one in front and hauling them across like a shaggy, bellowing daisy chain. Several animals lost their tails in the process. There are countless stories of cattle turning on their backs and deliberately drowning themselves rather than submit to the rigours of the crossing. Nowadays, such cruelty would be unacceptable. So, in the end, like all the other modern travellers passing through, John Kay's Highland herd catched the ferry. Next stop is the Scottish mainland, and by far the toughest part of the journey. The drovers have made some mistakes, and they've had some setbacks, but they've learned some valuable lessons too. They're working as a team now, drawn closer together by the problems they've shared. How would you like us to take off the monitor, Julia? <laughs> look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. Julia, look at that. No, 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 no.
They're even beginning to look like real drovers. People who will be a match for the wilds of Rannoch Moor and the granite slopes of Ben Nevis up ahead. It's a hundred years since the highlands of Scotland saw a sight like this. Native cattle being driven along the old drove roads on their way to the markets of the south. Long before the days of trains and cattle wagons, drovers and their beasts opened up the mountains and glens to trade and travel. What they've achieved so far, with over a hundred miles of wild country under their belts, many would have thought impossible. No, it's that way. Go on. Which oh. one? <laughs> this is real Highland country, north of Glencoe and Rannoch Moor. On stretches like this, the drovers learn the hard way what life must have been like for their counterparts of two or three centuries ago. Every day was a hard Highland cocktail of danger, cold and hunger. The modern drovers can't do much about the first two, but when it comes to sustenance, they're strictly 20th century. Yes. JP, you have some coffee? I dram, JP. Now you're talking. I know you're a caffeine addict. <laughs> I didn't know there was a little coffee hut here in <laughs> the past. <laughs> Is that a cafe? Tired and weary drovers. You'd imagine that on a bleak <laughs> hillside, little surprising was likely to happen. But coping with the unexpected has become an everyday affair on the drove. Just when they're feeling they could be a million miles from civilization, up the hill comes a land drover with an inspector well, from the right, Scottish yeah. Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Hey, Hello. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you? How's things going? Fine. Oh, not bad, not bad. You're resting, eh? We are resting. We're giving them their statutory rest, as you can yeah. see. Oh, very good. Do you want to take their temperature and read their pulse? <laughs> they're doing all right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're fine. Mm. You had to leave two behind, didn't you? Well, no, we only left one behind. One behind. And one's a friend for the other one. With the drove's own vet, Chris right. Wiper, ministering to the animal's every need, oh, there's little well. to worry the cruelty man. Um, I'm looking all right. We've got one or two... Beasts that have gone a bit lame, but we've left them down at the bottom. That's and right, to see that. Okay. They're going round in the lorry. That's good. That's okay. But the rest of them are doing fine. Yeah, look good. Tending to walk on the on the edges where it's soft. Yeah, you'd be much better now. Apart from the hard slog through tough country, the volatile weather has been causing the greatest discomfort. Highland rain gets to the spots no other rain seems to reach. And on days like this, the drovers are even convinced their skin is letting in water. On top of that, tonight, there's a major disappointment. They'd been expecting to sleep in a couple of cottages used by a Scottish club of lady mountaineers, but they arrive to find them locked. Permission to use them has been refused. It's at moments like this that droving, modern or otherwise, does not seem such fun. However, they're cheered by the arrival of John's wife, Julia, with their backup Land Rover laden with provisions for men and beasts. Are you all right? Yes, we're all fine. You all got here, no bother at all? Yeah, we've been here since no lunchtime. What's no captured? What? No disasters. What's well, no. captured? You're looking very clean, Julia. Did you have a bath, Julia? Oh, what? What was that? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Special brew. Look at it. Lovely stuff. <laughs> Hold me. Hold me. Come on, then. 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 Six o'clock in the morning, and Russell Buchanan sets out to show that they do make men like they used to. Russell, a farmer and hotelier from Argyle, joined the drove through his friendship with the Kays. It's noticeable that none of the others join him in his Spartan ablutions. They've obviously taken to heart the old Scottish maxim, 
that the best place for cold water is in a glass of whiskey. Back on the mountain and a close encounter of the woolly kind. The highway code is a little obscure in the highlands, but the cattle, gentlemen that they are, give way to the sheep. Ah, but what's it like in front of us? Oh, it's very rough, you know. It's hard or boggy? Bits hard and bits boggy, yes. Are there peat hags to go over? The peat, yes, a lot of peat bogs in front of you. Oh, I'll let me meet you tomorrow, I'm sure. Good day. Coming back again. Ah, we're going to way back tonight. We're way back to Love Teak tonight, eh? The advantage of having a vet on the drove becomes clear when the beast's horns start to become flaky. Mineral deficiency is diagnosed and special feed containing the missing minerals is ordered. It's the first real sign that these domestic cattle, which are more used to lazy grazing than forced marching, are feeling the strain. Okay. Their feet, too, are showing signs of soreness after some of the more stony stretches of the drove. A foot bath containing formalin is prescribed to harden them up. With the cattle's feet seen to, the drovers decide to have a knees up. In a little hall near a shooting lodge, the local gillies and gamekeepers throw them a cayley. It's a welcome break from the rigours of droving. But who would have guessed tired legs were up to this kind of thing? The cayley along the way is very much in keeping with the traditions of former centuries. New faces were such a welcome sight in the glens that hospitality for the old drovers tended to be fulsome. At such stops, they're said to have drunk enough whiskey to fill Loch Ness and dance the buckles off their shoes. At either activity, John Kay's drovers are not found wanting. Morning again, the sharp air and steep climb dispel all thoughts of hangover. This is the last major uphill push of the drove. The summit, marked by stone cairns, is reached without any obvious sign of pain. From dawn till dusk, there are chores to be done. Arrival at a mountain bothy does not mean the end of the day's work. Well, if we get them over there, if, if, if there's heavy rain in the night, it'll be a darn sight easy to get across both ourselves and... Oh, geez, what a mess. Anyway, they'll go. Come on, whoa! Back you go, boys. Go on, boys. The gabbing's gone. Don't come to me. Oh, just time, just time, just time. Don't push them over that bank. Perhaps the biggest difference between these drovers and their predecessors is in the matter of personal hygiene. The old drovers grew beards, never changed out of their plaids from the start of the drove to the finish. It wouldn't have been wise to get downwind of them. But John Kay and his men at least make an effort. Well, it, has, it was quite difficult. I mean, it, it's, it's warm enough today, but I mean, we have had very, very cold temperatures and um, gales and things, and it's not very conducive to um, um, stripping off. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think, I, I think that was the worst bit. I mean, we had a, we had a period of about um, a week or ten days when we didn't ever really stop anywhere also, so there was never any time. I and mean, it was always dark by the time uh, one might have got around to washing. It must be a great temptation, though, to drop one's standards and just get dirtier and dirtier. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Russell, do you take sugar in your coffee? In mountain terms, this is the lap of luxury. Any weary walker will agree that a no-star bothy is better than a five-star tent any day. Hundreds of years ago, the diet consisted of oatmeal and whiskey. Kay and his men have compromised. They've left out the oatmeal. As the drovers settle in for the night, the subject everybody has been avoiding finally comes up. The fate of the 30 Highland cattle in their charge. The plan all along has been to sell them at the end of the trip in which case they'll end up as so many prime steaks on restaurant tables. Because of everything they've been through together, that's a fate some of the drovers don't want to think well, about. The thing, that, the thing that I'm really worried about is the sale. I mean, I just can't bear to sort of um, parting with all those boys out there and the thought of them going to 
fatteners, which but is they, what the inevitably will happen, isn't it? But they're much too young to go to the butcher, aren't they? No, yeah, some of them it will kill. Oh, they can't. Yeah. But I mean, there's but, some lovely specimens. I mean, you yeah. know, the heads that turn some of these. I mean, if only we could find either. some stately home or safari park who would be interested in taking all of them or most of them. I mean, I'd be prepared to sell them cheap, I think, oh. to someone who said that they were going to be, they were going to be rewarded for, the, I mean, what has actually been quite a tough few weeks. The Highland beast has always been for beef, and I mean, it's, it's like the Aberdeen Angus, I mean, it predecedes that, in that, I mean, the slow growing, the slower growing the meat is, the finer it is and the better quality the, the, sure. the beef is in the long run. I mean, yeah, it's but, sort of an Yeah, but I mean, these boys, they deserve some reward. The thing is that they are, I mean, they're, they're, they're super, uh, super meat. I yeah, mean, but they're they're you can't, how can you think of those as meat? But they are, they're lovely. I mean, if you look at the, the, the quality <laughs> of those beasts and the haunches and everything they've got on them, they're tremendous. Oh, yeah, but you can't. It's like eating your friend, isn't it? Well, oh, I mean, you, you could. Know. No, it's awful. <laughs> I mean... Let's face it, you don't object to any of the meat you've eaten on this trip. Yeah, but I haven't known them, have I? I haven't no, walked I hundreds of miles across Scotland in their company. Yeah, well, I mean, I've worked in a slaughterhouse before, and, I mean, you see the poor wee things there, and, I mean, I've had to put the bullet to them. And, I mean, it's, you know, you shouldn't... It's all psychological. I mean, you know, vegetarians and meat-eaters, I mean, they all yeah, have I mean, this hang-up like... about, you know, not eating the thing. You go, you'll grow the lettuce in your own garden and then you don't think of it as a nice wee friend that's got nice and fat. Unless it's <laughs> keeping you company and sort of snoring gently outside your tent at night. Crossing Rannoch Moor, one of the most desolate spots in Europe, thoughts of the cattle's fate are put to one side. This is the last hazardous leg of the drone. Deep bogs and Jekyll and Hyde weather. One minute the elements are smiling, the next they're throwing a fit. All the drovers can do is put their brains into a kind of neutral and keep on walking. This they'll do till the cows come home, because journey's end, at last, is almost in sight. Creef and the end of the road. Five weeks and 200 miles after setting out from the Isle of Skye, John Kay and his herd of Highland cattle finally reach civilization. Against all the odds, they've proved it can be done. The people of Creef turn out to welcome the parade, as they must have done for the droves of centuries ago.